nice speech lady. Useful resources for medical SLPs created by one who is just like you out in the field. Creative, practical, evidence-based resources. Building up, learning from one another. Welcome to the Nice Speech Lady Show. My name is Wilson Nice. Thanks for joining us today. We've got a great show lined up for you today. I have a great guest that I'm interviewing. Hillary Cooper from the Dysphagia Outreach Project will join us here in a minute. Want to welcome you to the show. Nice Speech Lady is a resource and blog a website for medical SLPs. It's a place where you can go to get complimentary uh, free uh, resources uh, that can be helpful for use in uh, home programs, handouts for families, uh, assessment tools, links to other helpful websites, and much, much more. So please check out nicespeechlady.com and please come and uh, learn what you can about what we have to offer. I wanted to share before we transition to the interview today, I wanted to talk a little bit about a resource that I created a couple of years ago uh, that I uh, had available at the launch of the website. Uh, and it's the um, Nice Speech Lady AAC Alphabet Board. So this is a PDF that I created. It's a simple alphabet board. Um, however, uh, what's different about it is it also has uh, sentences above and below the alphabet letters uh, that allow the patient uh, to communicate um, sentences through pointing in addition to the letters. Um, so I thought that I would pull it up here really quickly. I uh, was reminded of this resource this week um, in using it with a patient and uh, wanted to talk a little bit about um, the usefulness of this tool. So uh, what we can do with this resource is uh, when we're starting out with AAC with a patient, we can use it to determine if the patient is compatible with um, the options for AAC to see about their compatibility to see if uh, low tech or high tech options are going to be um, something that we're going to want to pursue with the patient. Um, sometimes no tech uh, options are going to fulfill the needs of the patient. Sometimes, however, when a patient has used high tech options and they have a progressive condition and it looks like uh, those options are no longer viable for the patient. Sometimes we need to ramp down back to low tech or no tech options and use uh, no tech options in other different creative type of ways uh, in order to uh, assist in communication. So. Uh, with assistance from caregivers, uh, these no tech devices are an option as well, including having caregivers point to the letters for the patient and asking, are you choosing this letter, yes or no? If the patient has a yes or no response still, um, that's a way to get uh, letter cues in order to determine uh, what the patient is trying to say, at least get some more information in order to then ask further yes, no questions. So I wanted to pull up that alphabet board. So we're gonna go to nicespeechlady.com and we'll go to resource library number one. We'll head down to AAC. We'll head down to AAC Handoutables. And then we'll go to the nicespeechlady.com alphabet point board plus. And here on the PDF, we have all of the letters plus an indicator for spacing between words. We have a number of phrases here uh, to choose from. Please give me time to point to what I desire to say. Repeat the question, please. Yes, no, I don't know. I'll try again. And please say the letters as I point to them. We also have understand that. Uh, a number of uh, numbers. Uh, that is almost my message. Let's try again. We are having trouble communicating. Uh, hand me a straw, please, so I can point uh, to help the patient with uh, pointing to what they'd like to choose. And then let's just talk later. There's also a section here for the patient to have their name and who their speech pathologist is. So if the patient would like to uh, point to their name or point to their speech pathologist, uh, they have that option. Wanted to transition now uh, to today's guest. 
So Hillary Cooper graduated from the University of Houston in 2011 with her MA in Communication Disorders and is the owner of North Louisiana Swallow Solutions, a mobile fees provider. And she also created an online SLP gift shop called slpstuff.com, which donates a portion of every sale to SLP-related charitable organizations. She co-founded the Dysphagia Outreach Project, which is a 501c3 uh, nonprofit organization which has a number of missions, including, according to the website, collecting, distributing dysphagia supplies to those in need, establishing dysphagia awareness advocacy programs, providing educational services related to appropriate prescription and use of a dysphagia supplies, assisting in establishing a network of dysphagia support groups, improving interdisciplinary team building and cooperation to ensure individuals with dysphagia, family caregivers, and care team members are educated regarding evidence based practice. She also guest lectures at universities, conferences, and teaches across the country, makes podcast appearances, is a content creator for the Medical SLP Collective, is a member of SIG 13, and was a member of the 2019 ASHA Program Planning Committee for Business and Practice Management. In addition, she is also working on achieving her board certification in swallowing and swallowing disorders. She has quite, she has quite an impressive team of SLPs on her team at the Dysphagia Outreach Project, working to achieve her mission to provide meaningful assistance to individuals affected by dysphagia. She's also publication chair for LASHA, the Louisiana Speech Language Hearing Board of Directors, and the adjunct clinical supervisor for the University of Louisiana at Monroe. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. That's quite an impressive resume there. You know, I'm, nobody can ever accuse me of being bored. <laughs> so thank you for taking the time to meet with me. Um, I've been wanting to speak with you for quite some time, so I appreciate you taking the time. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm always happy to, to take some time to spread the word of what we're doing. So I have a number of questions. I, I, I'm really interested in the dysphagia food bank uh, with your outreach project. Um, can you tell me how it works? And for the nice speech lady readers, um, you know, what, what is your project in a nutshell and what do they need to know? So basically, um, I had this, this concept, so where it all came from, I think, is in Louisiana, I, I worked in a variety of different settings and I had a private practice and I had a contract with a home health company and I was going out to this very rural, um, low income area. And I found myself in the position where um, recommendations were made at the hospital for use of thickeners or modified diets. And my patients didn't have the materials or the finances to be able to afford either thickener or a blender, a food chopper to be able to make a minced and moist or a puree food uh, diet and to be successful in the home setting with those supplies, things like Provel cups, adaptive, you know, spoons and plates and things. And I found myself spending money out of my own pocket to provide them with those items. And I, at the time I was like, wow, I wish there was a, some sort of like a food bank that I could go to that would have these items. And then I kind of shelved the idea and I was like, oh no, 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 that's like way too big. That's not something I could do. Um, I did reach out to some organizations and they were all like, nope, 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 sorry, we can't help you. Um, so I sat on the idea for a few years and then finally decided to act on it and was inspired by Teresa Richard, who told me to like, just stop wishing and just start doing. And so we created the Dysphagia Outreach Project initially with the mind of doing the Dysphagia Food Bank, but then the, the idea grew, why are we limiting ourselves to just one project when there's so many areas that can be advocated for in the world of dysphagia? So we changed it to the, to the concept of the Dysphagia Outreach Project, which has multiple sub-projects, one of which being the Dysphagia Food Bank. So um, regarding the Dysphagia Food Bank, um, what I love about it is that we are able to connect with um, product manufacturers who donate products to us or um, allow us to buy them inexpensively. And then we're able to get those to individuals who cannot afford it. So our, our general guideline is, is that if the individual 
qualifies for Medicaid or falls under those low income, um, the poverty level guideline for that state. Um, and we do operate across the 50 states. So we look at each state's level because the poverty guideline in California is different than the poverty guideline in Louisiana because we know cost of living is different everywhere. So we look at the, the cost of living in that area and also we take into account extenuating circumstances. So maybe a person doesn't have necessarily a lower income, but they just lost their job because of COVID, then we'll take that into consideration as well. So what we do is we, we provide those individuals with the dysphagia um, supplies basically that they need to be successful in the home environment without having that financial burden um, be catastrophic, which it can be. So, um, you know, I've heard of people having to choose between paying their electric bill or paying for thickener. And you know what wins? Electricity is going to win every single time. And I've heard of families using products that shouldn't be used as thickeners, like store-bought um, cornstarch as a thickener in their, their baby's bottle because they can't afford gel mix. Um, so we, we created this in order to help to bridge it's twofold. The first product part of the dysphagia food bank is to help bridge the healthcare inequality gap. Cause I find that the individuals who need our help the most are, are ignored. Like this is completely ignored by the fact like Medicaid will pay for everything. Medicaid will pay for a feeding tube, all the formula they need and then some, and they'll give them so much formula for their feeding tube that they won't even be able to use it but they will not pay for thickener in, in a lot of cases and they will not pay for an adaptive bottle or they will not pay for a Provel cup if it's an adult. So um, I think the second aspect of it, so the first part is, you know, we're giving these things to people to help them be successful in the home. And then the second aspect is that we're raising awareness of this as a problem and as, as something that needs to be addressed on a bigger scale. So until someone shines a light on the problem, it doesn't exist. So we just showed up on the scene with a big giant spotlight saying, hey, look, here's a problem that we have this um, healthcare inequality situation that needs to be resolved. So um, that's the second part of the dysphagia food bank that I really love. So, um ensuring awareness of the evidence-based practice is one of your missions that has been described. Um, can you share with us what, you, you know, in your trainings and in your advocacy, what the three biggest eye-openers have been in terms of evidence-based practice that, that you've shared with clinicians and family members and patients? Absolutely. Um, we do a journal club, a SLP journal club, and it's free. It's freely accessible. We stream it on our Facebook page. And we actually brought have brought up, we've done our, we just finished our third one and every one we do just gets better and, and more people join and it's so exciting. Um, but we bring in some of the articles that were mind blowing to us as a board. Um, so we've talked about the Nativ Seltzer article that looked at pulmonary injury um, from aspiration of different types of thickener as compared to aspiration of just plain water. That one was a game changer for me because, you know, it, it showed us there, were, there was a lot of questions um, after that about the safety of aspirating cornstarch thickener. And I kind of went down, you know, just down the rabbit hole regarding that and diving into not the speech pathology literature, but there's a ton of emerging literature in the pulmonology journals right now about the safety of aspirating different substances. And I think that we as clinicians need to think about that when we recommend different products, that it's not just what's palatable and what's the best, but there's multiple other issues um, surrounding our choice of products, um, specifically the, the biggest game changer, I think, was that Native Seltzer article because, um, and because of that article and because of that journey through the evidence that I took when I, after I read that article, um, the Dysphagia Outreach Project has chosen not to accept donation of cornstarch thickener. Yeah, and I saw that. So I think some people are like, but why? You know, it, it's so much cheaper and it's so much shelf stable. But right now the evidence is showing that um, we know that individuals may be more likely to silently aspirate thickened liquids than they would thin liquids. And we know, so we advocate not to thicken at the bedside. So that's another one. Um, and I think that was the 
Seven. I don't, I don't want to tell you. I'll, I'll give you the link to that article. I can't recall it off the top of my head. My brain's tired today. Um, but yeah, that was another article that's um, tremendously impactful. So, so we recommend not to thicken at the bedside. And then if they're thickening at the bedside, the patient's silently aspirating nectar thick, and you were putting cornstarch in their lungs, we could be setting our patients up for pulmonary injury. So, so those are, are really, really important facts. Um, I also didn't really think about the ingredients and the thickeners that we're using ever. And I didn't even realize prior to going into this um, that there were so many thickeners. And this is a question that I ask a lot of um, clinicians, as a matter of fact, is how many types of thickeners, not brands, but types of thickeners do you think are out there? And most of the time they answer like, oh, I don't know, like three, four maybe. Um, and the answer is eight. There's eight different major types of thickeners that are out there on the market and they all have pros and cons and they have, you know, populations that they should be used on and populations they should not be used on. So I think for me, looking at the evidence and realizing, you know, that thickener, thicker isn't always better, um, that we should be doing those instrumentals to see whether patients really do need thickener instead of just knee jerk thickening things. Um, realizing the thickener has potential health consequences, including pulmonary injury. And then, you know, making sure that the products that we are recommending are appropriate for the person that we're, we're looking at each person and the products um, in a holistic way. So um, my analogy for that is that there are uh, countless hypertension drugs, right? Because some work for other people, some interfere with medications with other conditions and they, you know, so there's not a one size fits all hypertension medicine and it's the same way with thickeners. And so I encourage clinicians to um, look into the, and, and that's one of the things we're working on. We have a webinar coming out soon about all the different types of thickeners, but um, looking great. into it and thinking about it based off of your specific patient's characteristics and needs and um, instrumentation and kind of going from there. So you have the journal club. What are your other advocacy programs? What, what do those look like? So we have a lot of stuff right now in the background. So we are working on establishing a series of webinars that are going to be free. Everything that we do, we want it to be free. Or if you want to donate, you can donate. But we want it to be freely available to not just clinicians, um, but our interdisciplinary peers. So we have plans to do um, a deep dive into thickeners um, in the next month or so. We were going to do it in June for Dysphagia Awareness Month, but we decided to step back and um, tone down for a minute to let our uh, Black, Indigenous, People of Color SLP colleagues have the stage. And I think that was a fantastic idea, and I'm so glad that we did that. Um, and when we feel the time is appropriate, then we're going to launch um, a really big fundraising effort and in part of that is going to be webinars we have a planned series for uh, parents of children with dysphagia um, hosted by our wonderful pediatric consultants Kristen West and Casey Lewis we have plans for an adult caregiver or adult with dysphagia um, empowerment webinar that's kind of how I view them is we want to give our family members and our caregivers and our individuals with dysphagia, the, the confidence and the tools and even sometimes just the words and phrases to know, to ask, to be able to empower them to take control of their own health care. Um, regarding the children's side, the pediatric side, I hear a lot of parents say things like, well, this doctor said that and this doctor said that and they're just not getting the page together and what do I do? I feel so frustrated. And I think that if we provide them with some tools um, that they can be referred to by their SLP, instead of spending the entire session educating mom, how about we tell mom to watch this webinar and give her some tools and then you spend that whole time working with the kiddo. And um, so we want to be able to provide those tools for clinicians to refer to family members to help them 
advocate for their own care in and for what they need advocating for instrumentals so if the slp is asking for an instrumental and getting shot down and the family's asking for an instrumental the family's probably going to get their way <laughs> most of the time they do so like teaching them to advocate for themselves is going to be tremendous um so we have the journal club we have the webinar series on different um supply items we're going to start with thickeners because that's the big big elephant in the room is the thickener stuff um, but then we do intend to talk about when do you want to use a provel cup what are the pros and cons of a provel cup what are the pros and cons of a safe straw and all those different um, tools that we use for dysphagia as well so we have lots of those in the works they're they're happening so speaking on instrumentals um, i work full-time in the home health setting um, as my bread and butter job and um, there are no um, mobile units that go into uh, people's homes in in my area that I work in so everyone has to go to uh, the hospital for an instrumental um, where I used to live in Texas there were mobile units mm -hmm. your your fees company do you go into people's homes or do you only go into facilities at this time in Louisiana, I'm only going into facilities. Um, there's no regulations against it. So some states don't allow um, dysphagia assessments like uh, modified barium swallows mobile or mobile fees in the home setting. Uh, Tennessee is one of them. They don't allow fees in the home. Louisiana doesn't have those restrictions where I found the barrier to be for me getting into the home health setting is reimbursement. So the home health companies want to pay me basically when you work it out per hour and how much time and effort and energy I spend into the um, evaluation, they want to pay me less per hour than they would a treating clinician going in. And to me, that's unacceptable. And I'm going to advocate for my worth every day. Um, so they, 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 they don't get reimbursed enough to even pay us. They're not even offering to pay us the Medicare reimbursement rate for, for the code for 92612. So that's been a barrier. The other barrier is making sure that um, you do it in a safe way and that you aren't just going in by yourself and doing a fees on a patient with just the caregiver there. That You have, you know, the an RN in ideally a second medical staff member there so that if something goes wrong you have backup medical backup um not that the complications of fees is is very uh, prevalent but it's always good to have backup so um i think those are the two barriers that i found with getting into home health um in doing fees in louisiana but each state is different and there's some states where they do fees in the home health all the time right well, I used uh, mobile video swallow uh, companies in Texas uh, mm -hmm. when I lived there, and it was extremely helpful um, mm -hmm. for, for access for, for people that wouldn't otherwise be able to have instrumentals, and that was, that was really helpful, but there, there's not that possibility here. So that's, that's something that, um, that uh, is a barrier to, to some folks getting instrumentals. Absolutely, and, and we do... Um we do request that the individuals who apply for the dysphagia food bank have had an instrumental but we also are realistic and we know that there are real tangible barriers for those so for those individuals who haven't had an instrumental and they were maybe put you know with thick and liquids at the bedside then then we reach out to our network of volunteers and put our really amazing brains together and see if we can figure out a way to um problem solve that specific patient situation and see if we can find them connections and resources to be able to get the instrumental that they need. So maybe they weren't aware that their insurance would cover it, you know, or maybe they weren't aware that they could call their insurance company and ask them if it's covered. Um, so sometimes just educating and pointing them in the right direction can help them move towards getting that instrumental assessment. And so hopefully if it's a thorough one, then they won't need a thickened liquid. And if they do, then we're here to support them and help them. But, um, you know, I'm just as happy to send out adaptive equipment as, as I am sure. thickened. Even more happy in some cases. Oh, so. absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so you, you, it's mentioned on your website also about dysphagia support groups. Is that yeah. something that you're, um, you're kind of organizing and, and um, 
how many support groups are there across the country? And so at, at this time, we don't have any established yet. And the, the reason is that we had brought on an individual who was going to help us with running that. And they had family, um, a family emergency come up and they weren't able to fulfill that role. Um, so what my vision is, is um, that we we want to get established with universities across the country. So we have made dozens of connections at this point with different universities across the country. And my vision includes having a local branch of the dysphagia food bank housed at that university. So they have a little storage closet that they can give to us. We can send them thickeners or have things shipped to them. Thickeners, adaptive equipment. Um, oh my gosh, we just got, I don't know if you can see, Nutribullets. I have Nutribullets mm -hmm. on my table that just came in. Um, you know, and oral care supplies. We were very ad adamant about that. And have those housed at the university. And the university NISLA volunteers will help us with um, inventory management, shipping, disbursement to the people who need it, and even collecting supplies. And then also having them help us out with uh, running a local dysphagia support group in association with the dysphagia food bank branch. So that's my ultimate vision. We are in the process right now of making those relationships with the universities and working on the behind the scenes um, inventory management system. So, you know, when you're looking at, oh gosh, dozens and, and of different products and thousands of packets of, you know, different types of thickeners and expiration dates, and then we track who donated it, who is it going to, um, how much did we send that person, how much are they using, did they send anything back to us, you know, and all we track all kinds of data on it. So it gets really complex on the behind the scenes part of it. Um, but we are working towards applying for some grants that might help us with, you know, buying equipment that would make the inventory management side of things a lot easier. Of course, if there's any companies out here who do inventory management who would love to donate equipment to us, that would be amazing. But, you know, we want to make the system usable by um, grad students across the country and their faculty uh, supervisor uh, and sponsor, the NISL sponsor. And to do that is going to require some serious logistical work. And so we, we have um, developed an amazing inventory system, um, but it is limited in its scale until we are able to acquire a grant that will give us the funds to be able to purchase, you know, like scanning inventory scanning guns so that we can mm -hmm. like, instead of having to manually type in everything in a system, which is prone to errors, we want to be able to scan it in, have a barcode with the patient, the recipient's ID information, scan the barcode, scan the item, barcode, item, barcode, item, and then box it and then in, and be done. And there's ways to do that. It just requires money. So, um, and so that's our, our goal is once we get into those universities and we house our food bank locations in those universities, they'll also have a um, support group set up as well to, so they go hand in hand. So um, there's also mention about research. Is the Dysphagia Re Outreach Project doing research or, or involved in research? We have actually several projects going on research-wise. So I, I think that, like we talked about earlier, you know, this, this problem of individuals not having the supplies and materials they need is kind of like an invisible problem because if nobody's really putting a light on it, it doesn't exist. So one of the um, goals of our research projects, and we've done a lot of the, the data collection, not the actual like going out and survey data collection, but we've done a lot of the lit review search so far. We've had amazing volunteers help us with that. But one of our questions is how much are you as a clinician spending out of pocket to provide supplies for patients who can't afford it on their own? So if I was to ask you, Wilson, how much do you, how much would you say? Have you ever bought product or supplies for a patient in home health? Oh, all the time. Right, exactly. How much money would you estimate that you've spent on those? Uh, cumulatively or every month? Like, think about monthly, on a monthly oh, expense. I'd say probably 100 
uh, at least every month. So that's $1,200 a year, right? And who should be paying for that? So I, I, I think every clinician that I ask about, who, especially those, you know, even in the pediatric, I, I live in the adult world. So, you know, in the adult world, every single adult clinician I know, I've asked them that same question. How much money have you spent or have you ever spent money out of your own pocket to buy dysphagia supplies for your patient? Every single one has, without exception, said, yeah, I've done it. And yeah, it's probably 100 to $200 a month. And so I would like to quantify that. So that's one of our questions that we want to answer is how much are we as clinicians spending out of our own pocket of money that we're underpaid as it is. <laughs> we're not getting paid what our, our PT colleagues are. And so, you know, then we're spending money out of our own pockets to provide materials for um, our patients that should be provided by insurance or even if our employer is aware of the fact that we're spending this money, we should be getting a stipend for that. Um, there's been research in other fields about how much people spend out of pocket. So for example, we know that on average, a school teacher will spend $500 a year on supplies for their own classroom, school supplies. Um, and so nobody has done research on that in our field and specifically with an eye on the dysphagia um, supplies. So we have that working. Um, we, I actually applied for a, um, ASHA Foundation uh, Dysphagia Clinician Collaboration Grant with Dr. Natalie Douglas. And we're looking at, um, you know, there's the myth of, oh, individuals with, dysp with uh, dementia can't do fees. Um, that's one of my favorites. <laughs> individuals with dementia can't do fees um, because, you know, they don't understand what's going on. They're, they're not going to tolerate it. So, um, I consider myself to be sort of a dementia whisperer with fees and I have a very high success rate. Of course, now I say that I'm going to have like some combative patients next week because I just cursed myself. But um, I think, so our, our project is looking at um, an education protocol and using visual aids to prepare individuals with dementia for a fees procedure in the, in, and also training um, aides in the treating SLP and the clinician who's, who the, is the endoscopist in techniques that will improve your likelihood of success with um, completing a fees procedure in individuals with dementia. So I know that Natalie eventually intends to do that also with modified barium swallow study as well, but um, my part, since I'm a fees provider, has to do with the, the fees, and we do intend to have those um, resources and training available on the Dysphagia Outreach Project website, and my portion of the grant that I would be getting paid as a researcher is 100% being donated to the Dysphagia Outreach Project, so um, to help support our mission, so um, we're doing that as, as the nonprofit. And, and like I said, our ultimate goal is to put tangible things, uh, useful things in people's hands that make their life easier or better or more effective as a clinician. So if we can put this tool in people's hands, um, then that's going to be amazing. So that's great. Well, and it would be really easy for us to sell it and make a whole lot of money off of it, but that's not that's not the purpose of this. That's right. not what we want to do. We want to be able to put it, make it freely available, downloadable for possibly an optional donation. Like if you want to give us a dollar, give us a dollar. Uh, but if you just need it, then take it. Right. <laughs> and that's how I view view the um, the products that we do. So um, we have some pediatric stuff going, um, working with Mary Widener uh, from Edinburgh University and um, Dr. Kate Crivell from Edinburgh. So we have some pediatric things in the works that we're still trying to, um, we had a question looking at attitudes and perceptions with dysphagia um, in pediatric, the pediatric population. And that question uncovered a host of other questions. So what we thought was going to be like maybe a year long project is now like a series of six research projects so that we can get to the actual big question, which is sometimes what happens when you do research. So we have several different projects going on in various stages and 
um, super excited to, to, and we know that these are a long game. Anyone who's ever done research, y'all know that this isn't going to come out like next week. It's going to take us a minute, but we do have multiple projects going on and um, lots of really important questions that we're looking at getting answered. And when we do decide to, um, when we get our IRB approval and we start posting our, our questionnaires, um, encourage all of you guys to, to participate and answer and help us um, shine a spotlight on some of the issues that we have in our field. Well, let me know how I can help um, get the word out. Um, also, on, on Nice Speech Lady, I have a Causes to Support tab. So um, I'm happy to um, have the Dysphagia Outreach Project um, added to that page so that people yeah. can go to, go to your site from my site. I'm happy to do that. I can add that as soon as possible. Um, speaking of Causes to Support, I know you have sponsors. You mentioned that you have sponsors that mm -hmm. um, provide provide um, products or products at a, at a reduced rate. Um, I wanted to give you an opportunity to mention all of your sponsors. Oh, well, thank you. And, and honestly, I, I, when I first started this um, forever ago, it, it seemed like it was so big. Like this is so much bigger than one person can do. And I was absolutely right because it, it, is, it is so big. And this vision that our board has put together is tremendous you guys we have like a 10-year plan like a 10-year plan and, and it's like the things is like i close my eyes and i see it in 10 years and it's just brilliant and it wouldn't be here we wouldn't be able to do it without um the support of our sponsors so our top level sponsors right now are Simply Thick. Uh, John Holohan from Simply Thick has been on board since before we were actually incorporated. As soon as it was a seed of a thought and my idea and I spoke it out loud, John Holohan was like, I'm in. <laughs> and so they've been tremendous with giving us products, um, extremely generous with giving us products. Um, the Medical SLP Collective has been uh, extremely generous with giving us a financial donation to help sponsor shipping. Um, Hallie Bulkin, from Feed the Peds and the Untethered podcast also gave us a, a wonderful financial donation to be able to support shipping, which you get each, each package that we, sh we send it ranges between 13, 20 is what a medium flat rate box is to $20. So we try to do the flat rate boxes, especially with the Simply Thick because that stuff's heavy. So I will like, I am a firm believer if it fits, it ships. <laughs> and so we will squeeze it in there and do what we can to try to fit as much in there and save the money so that we can help more people with it. Um, our, our next level sponsors, we have the Informed SLP. Um, so she also helped us out with shipping. Global Flow has helped us out with um, product um, design from scratch concepts. That's Mike Kurtz. He has done all of our branding in all of our um, graphic design stuff completely free of charge because he believes in our cause so much. His wife's a speech pathologist. And so he designed, he did all of our stuff. So if you love our logo, go to design by scratch concept concepts. Sorry, my phone's buzzing. <laughs> Um, and then we have so many other ones, so I'll just list them off real quick. So we have Tri-State Imaging and Swallowing, um, Texas Mobile Fees Association, Mobile Scope, um, North Louisiana Swallow Solutions, that's my company. My company has donated a lot of money to help us get incorporated. Um, SLPstuff.com donates a portion of every sale. Um, Tactus Therapy, love their apps. Um, hard to Swallow, so Will Farnham, he's a huge supporter of us. Jenna castro Casbin from The Independent Clinician um, has helped us out and also had me on her podcast. Um, Amp Care, um, wonderful people, Rick and Russ are great. Swallowing and Neurologic Rehabilitation, North Dakota Fees Providers, Dr. Eric Blicker from CEU Allied Health is one of our supporters. Kelsey Day uh, recently donated a uh, scholarship to her um, documentation course for us to give away to a worthy clinician. That was so exciting. Um, speech Uncensored podcast, and then also like hundreds of SLPs and family members and, you know, just people who believe, who see our cause and, and see what we're doing and believe in it and donate $5 or $50 or $100 and, they, and countless people who've done that. So um, I think what's 
really important to note is that nobody on our board, including myself, takes a salary. Um, this is a 100% volunteer run organization. So I know that some people start nonprofits and they're like, oh, well now I have a tax-free way to make an income. But I would say this is like a reverse income for me <laughs> because I spend tons of time on it and I throw money at it and um, energy and everything and I don't get a penny back. So I am super... Um, super happy that you know we're able to use the funds that are so generously donated to us to promote our mission to get out there and really help people and um, even at this point you know set up some of the infrastructure that we need to be able to help more people next year and um, in answering some questions so we had to you know reach out to a lawyer so that was part of some of the expense because there's a lot of liability about providing dysphagia products to people free of charge um, and a lot of questions that we had about our application process and, and how to make it legal and <laughs> accessible <laughs> and making sure that everything we do is 100% above board. So um, yeah, that's that's where your money goes 100% to our mission. Okay. If, um, if any of the Nice Speech Lady readers want to contact your organization, what's the best way to reach out to you? So you can go to our website at dysphagiaoutreach.org or you can email us at team at dysphagiaoutreach.org. And if you go to our website, there's a contact us page. Um, or if you can't remember the email, uh, team at dysphagiaoutreach.org. Our communication director, Katie Goline, is um, the one that you'll be emailing there. And she's amazing because she gets all that incoming traffic and she just sends it to who it needs to go to. And she's just a miracle worker over there because um, that email can sometimes get a little bit overwhelming. <laughs> Can imagine with all of the people who need sure. help or have questions or want to donate products um yeah so it's definitely reach out to us through the website um if you have any family members um patients or anyone that you know who needs to access the dysphagia food bank um, we have our application it's completely online it can actually be completed from a cell phone we spent a good bit of time working on some technical uh, behind the scenes things to make that happen um, because we recognize that not all individuals um, who are low income have access to things like fax machines or printers or scanners um, and we or even laptops <laughs> so we wanted to have it to where the entire application could be completed on a smartphone so if um, they have a smartphone which almost everyone does these days then um, they'll be able to complete the application entirely online and it, it just takes a few minutes and on your website, you you ask for you know help for anyone who wants to volunteer. You're still needing help from from anyone who wants to volunteer. What what is your greatest need at this point? So right now we have a um, diversity committee, and one of the things that we've recognized is that some of the communities that need our help the most, um, we aren't getting to them. And so we started a diversity committee with the goal of improving our ability as an organization to make sure that the, that the people who really need our help are getting it. So we need individuals who can help us translate our website into different languages. So we wanna have you know, a section where you can click and then have you know, a brief condensed version of the website in various languages including the application for assistance. So we don't want them to have to just, I've had people tell me, well, why don't they just use Google Translate? I'm like, oh, that's just kind of rude. <laughs> like, how about we come to them and, and maybe put a little effort in and make it more accessible for individuals who speak Spanish or Portuguese or, you know, Mandarin. So I would love to have individuals who are fluent, like incredibly fluent in those languages reach out to us so that we can build that side of our website and that side of our practice and help us with incoming um, applications and translating them back to English so that we can process it and just be our, our, our go-to. 
for that um, because hiring translators gets very expensive. And if we can have volunteers do that um, and help us out with that, then that's money that we can be using towards the mission and providing shipping and things for our, our clients. The other thing that we always need is donation of oral care supplies. And right now we have a need for um, pediatric fluoride free toothpaste and pediatric toothbrushes. And both the gum, because we have little babies all the way up. So like the gum little finger brushes as well as toothbrushes. So we, we know that the evidence shows that, you know, there's the three pillars of pneumonia and oral care is one of those. So oral care is really important in preventing the uh, acquisition of aspiration pneumonia. So every single one of our packages that goes out to our recipients has a toothpaste and a toothbrush in it and a little oral care. We're working on developing that. It's almost done. I'm so excited. But for now, we just explained to them, you know, this is oral. It's important to have good oral care, but we do have a little um, card that's going to be going in there with it as well. And we think that, you know, promote, it's just another way for us to empower our, our, our families that we're helping in the individuals with dysphagia. Maybe they didn't realize that oral care was so important in um, dysphagia. So we're educating them. And then we're, again, taking away that burden. So maybe, maybe they don't have it handy. Well, look, we're here. We're giving them a new one. <laughs> Whenever they get a new box, they get a new toothbrush and a little trial size toothpaste. So we do have a need for those things. Um, and then always, you know, adaptive equipment. We have a lot of thickener on stock right now. We've had very generous um, support by, you know, Parapharmatech, who makes gel mix pure thick, simply thick. Um, we have lots and lots of that coming in. We always welcome more. But um, those adaptive equipment things. So if you have Provel cups sitting around that you don't need, um, we will take them if they're used, if they're cleaned prior to being sent to us, and we'll sterilize them before we send them out to people. Um, we have need for respiratory muscle strength trainer devices, adaptive spoons, feeding, so high wall plates and things. And I have people ask me a lot why why feeding equipment, why spoons and plates, you, if you guys are dysphagia. But again, it goes back to the evidence. And we know that um, based off the predictors of aspiration pneumonia, self-feeding is one of them. So we want to encourage our patients to be able to feed themselves if we can, so that we can take one of those little predictors of aspiration pneumonia off the table. So that would be uh, why we support self-feeding as, as one of the, the goals of the dysphagia outreach project. Um, I do have to say that we will not at this time accept feeding tube formula and feeding tube supplies. So we've had lots of people reach out to us wanting to give us feeding tube formula and supplies. Um, if you are part of an organization that takes those items, we would love to connect so that we could divert those over. Um, but at this time, we have so much on our plate, literally, <laughs> with the supplies and things that we're collecting that... Um, that's just outside of the scope of what we're doing. But if, if you know of any other organizations or people who do it and would love to take it, I would love to, to have a contact to send them to. So, so, so a few organizations I've reached out to have said that they didn't want to get into that because of liability issues. Right. Okay. And so for us, it's more of a like, oh my gosh, we already have so much. <laughs> like right. that's a whole separate organization that could help with that. Um, right. And so, yeah. Right. So um, I, I think it's great what you're doing. Just so many facets uh, that you're that you're addressing. I mean, wow! Just an explosion of 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 things that you're doing. It's just phenomenal. And so uh, the word is tremendous. And, yeah. and uh, again, you know, it's not my nonprofit. It, it, it as soon as I started bringing on the team. Um, it ceased to be non my nonprofit and it became ours. And what I love about our team is that they've taken ownership of it and they are responsible for making it as amazing as it is because it is bigger than one person could do. It's at this point, we have hundreds of volunteers across the country. We have our 12 core board members. We have multiple committees with, you know, filled up with SLPs and, and people who want to help us out. And so, you know, it's been such a team effort and the community, the SLP community rallying behind it has just been humbling and amazing. So thank you for everything you do. 
and thank you for everyone who's involved in your organization for what you do. Um, the last question I have, I, I like to ask at the end of interviews, uh, what question did I not ask that you wish I would have asked uh, that would help communicate um, what, what you're saying today or what you're advocating for today? What, what did I not ask that you wish I would have asked that would be helpful today? Yeah, I feel like we, we really talked about, you know, the, the big points, you know, what, you know, it all just goes back to, to our mission, which we, you already covered that. So, you know, our mission is to provide tangible and meaningful assistance to individuals affected by dysphagia, whether that's caregivers or patients across the lifespan. So, you know, just to reiterate that, that um, we're here, we want to help. And if people want to volunteer, and um, participate we always welcome new volunteers you can sign up on our website dispageoutreach.org and our wonderful volunteer coordinator will, will do your intake and look at what skills you have and, and bring you on board uh, the team and yeah but I, I think you pretty much covered everything Okay. It's a lot. Well, it is a lot. It is a lot. When I was putting together my questions, I thought, well, there's so many things to ask about. I want to make sure and cover everything. But uh, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate you uh, carving out some time. And um, we'll, uh, we'll post this interview. And um, thanks, thanks again for your time. Well, thank you so much. I'm so glad to, to be here and to, to share what we're doing. And I think it's exciting. And thank you so much for supporting us and wanting to, to help us spread the word of what we're doing. And uh, say the name of your website one more time so listeners can, uh, can hear it again. It is dysphagiaoutreach.org. All right. Well, I'll let you get back to your work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a Appreciate good day. Appreciate you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.